Unit 3. IELTS Test Practice. Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation in which a student is inquiring about the cost of accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, East Coast Backpackers. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. Yes, sure. How much does it cost to stay at your hostel? Well, if you stay in the bunkhouse, it's $5.90 a night. That's sharing with five other people. The cost of the bunkhouse is $5.90 a night, so $5.90 has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, East Coast Backpackers. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. Yes, sure. How much does it cost to stay at your hostel? Well, if you stay in the bunkhouse, it's $5.90 a night. That's sharing with five other people. Right. Do you have anything else? We didn't really want to share with that many people. Sure. We've got cabins for $11 a night. Or if you want air conditioning, then they're $14. So... The cabins with air conditioning are $14. Correct. OK. Are you right on the beach? It's a five-minute walk to the beach, and we also have a swimming pool. What about diving? Can you do any scuba diving? Sure, and we offer a special package for diving. Great. I'll get back to you. Hello, Emu Park Hostel. Oh, hi. I'm just inquiring about the cost of staying at your hostel. Well, we've got a number of levels of accommodation. If you share with up to five others, it'll cost you $5 a night or $30 a week. Do you have any individual rooms? Yeah, we do. We've got rooms overlooking the beach with their own bathroom. How much are the rooms with the bathroom? $30 a night but we're booked out for the rest of the month. Oh, I see. And is it possible to scuba dive? I mean, are there any diving facilities? Not here, I'm afraid, but it's great for fishing. OK, not too keen on fishing, thanks. I might leave it then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Hello, East Coast Backpackers. Oh, hi. It's Sabina Toma here again. I called you earlier. Oh, yes, I remember. I'd like to make a reservation, if that's possible, for the bunkhouse. Fine. What dates were you looking at? Well, from today, if possible, for about a week. Oh, OK. Well, you're in luck because some people have just left this morning. Can you give me the exact address, please? OK. Well, it's the Backpackers Hostel, Shoot Harbour Road. That's S-H-U-T-E and another word, Harbour, which is spelled H-A-R-B-O-U-R. Shoot Harbour Road. OK, got it. And how do we get there from the town? We'll be arriving by coach. 
Well, you'll need to take a local bus. Catch the number 25 to the beach. It will have the words Golden Sands on the front of the bus. Right. Let me just write that down. Golden Sands. Just ask for the Backpackers Hostel. But it's only about two kilometres from the centre of town, so you could walk it. I think we'll get the bus. Oh, and one last thing. Do you have access to the internet? Yes. We've got a little internet cafe here with five computers, so you can send and receive emails. And how much does it cost to use the computers? That'll cost you $4 an hour. And we serve great coffee, too. So, is there a little shop where we can buy things? Yes, we sell a few essential things, you know, soap and toothpaste, that sort of thing. Thanks. That sounds perfect. We'll see you this evening. Right, Sabina. We'll see you then. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a guidance counsellor talking to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone. I'm the counselling administrator here at St Ives College and I've been asked to come and talk to you about our counselling team and the services that we offer. We have three professional counsellors here at St Ives. Louise Bagshaw, Tony Denby and Naomi Flynn. They each hold daily one-on-one -on -one sessions with students but which counsellor you see will depend on a number of factors. If you've never used a counsellor before, then you should make an appointment with Naomi Flynn. Naomi specialises in seeing new students and offers a preliminary session where she will talk to you about what you can expect from counselling, followed by some simple questions about what you would like to discuss. This can be really helpful for students who are feeling a bit worried about the counselling process. Naomi is also the best option for students who can only see a counsellor outside office hours. 
She is not in on Mondays, but starts early on Wednesday mornings and works late on Thursday evenings. So you can see her before your first class or after your last class on those days. Louise staffs our drop-in centre throughout the day. If you need to see someone without a prior appointment, then she is the one to visit. Please note that if you use this service, then Louise will either see you herself or place you with the next available counsellor. If you want to be sure to see the same counsellor on each visit, then we strongly recommend you make an appointment ahead of time. You can do this at reception during office hours or by using our online booking form. Tony is our newest addition to the counselling team. He is our only male counsellor, and he has an extensive background in stress management and relaxation techniques. We encourage anyone who is trying to deal with anxiety to see him. Tony will introduce you to a full range of techniques to help you cope with this problem, such as body awareness, time management, and positive reinforcement. Before you hear the rest of the talk. You have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Each semester. The counselling team runs a number of small group workshops. These last for two hours and are free to all enrolled students. Our first workshop is called adjusting. We've found that tertiary education can come as a big shock for some people. After the structured learning environment of school, it is easy to feel lost. In this workshop, we will introduce you to what is necessary for academic success. As you might expect, we're targeting first-year students with this offering. Getting organised follows on from the first workshop. Here, we're going to help you break the habit of putting things off, get the most out of your time, and discover the right balance between academic and recreational activities. With getting organised, we're catering to a broader crowd, which includes all undergraduates and postgraduates. Next up is a workshop called communicating. The way people interact here may be quite different to what you're used to, especially if you've come from abroad. We'll cover an area that many foreign students struggle with: how to talk with teachers and other staff. We'll cover all aspects of multicultural communication. International students tend to get a lot out of this class, so we particularly encourage you to come along. But I must say that sometimes students from a local background find it helpful too. So, everyone is welcome. The anxiety workshop is held later on in the year, and deals with something you will all be familiar with: the nerves and anxiety that come when exams are approaching. Many students go through their entire academic careers suffering like this, but you don't have to. Come to this workshop, and we'll teach you all about relaxation and how to breathe properly. As well as meditation and other strategies to remain calm, we've tailored this workshop to anyone who is going to sit exams. Finally, we have the motivation workshop. The big topic here is how to stay on target and motivated during long-term research projects. This workshop is strictly for research students, as less advanced students already have several workshops catering to their needs. Well, that's it. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions or want more information about our services, do come and see us at the counselling service. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students who are preparing for an English literature test. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hello, Lorna, Ian. Glad you could make it. You're the only two who put your names down for this literature tutorial, so let's get started, shall we? I want to run over some aspects of the novel *The Secret Garden* with you before the test next week. Be sure to take some notes and ask questions if you need to. Hey, Lorna, have you got a spare pen? Sure, here you are. Okay, so the story follows two key characters. You should refer to them as protagonists, who go by the names of Mary Lennox and Colin Craven. The story is set shortly after the turn of the twentieth century, and the narrative tracks the development of the protagonists as they learn to overcome their own personal troubles together. That's quite a common storyline, isn't it? Yes, you're right, Lorna. So, what can you tell me about the character of Mary? Well. In the beginning, she is an angry, rude child who was orphaned after a cholera outbreak, and forced to leave India and move to the United Kingdom to her uncle's house in Yorkshire. That's right, and there she meets Colin, who spends his days in an isolated room, believing himself to be permanently crippled, with no hope of ever gaining the ability to walk. The two strike up a friendship. And gradually learn by encouraging each other that they can both become healthy, happy, and fulfilled in life. Will we need to remember a lot of these details for the exam? Just the basic outline. Examiners don't want to read a plot summary; they know what the book is about. Focus on narrative techniques instead, such as point of view. What's that mean? It's all about how we see the story. This story, for example, is written from the perspective of what is called an omniscient narrator. Omniscient means all-knowing. So, as readers, we get to see how all the characters feel about things, what they like and don't like, and what their motivations are in the story. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Won't it be hard to write a technical analysis? After all, it's a kids' book. Well, it was initially pitched at adults, you know, but over the years it has become seen as a more youth-oriented work. And you're right in a sense: the simple vocabulary and absence of foreshadowing make the story very easy to follow and ideally suited for children. But that doesn't mean there isn't much to analyze. Look at the symbolism, for instance. Symbols are things, right? Material things like objects that stand for abstract ideas. Absolutely, yes. And the author uses many of them. There's the robin redbreast, for example, which symbolizes the wise and gentle nature that Mary will soon adopt. Note that the robin is described as not at all like the birds in India. Roses are used as well, as a personal symbol for Mistress Craven. You'll see they're always mentioned alongside her name, and Mistress Craven's portrait can also be interpreted as a symbol of her spirit. Are symbols just another name for motifs? No, motifs are a bit different. They don't have as direct a connection with something the way that a symbol does. Motifs are simply recurring elements of the story that support the mood. Are there any in this novel? Yes, two very important ones. The Garden of Eden is a motif. It comes up a few times in connection with the garden of the story, and then you've got the role that secrets play in the story. 
In the beginning, everything is steeped in secrecy, and slowly the characters share their secrets, and in the process, move from darkness to lightness, metaphorically. But also, in the case of Colin, quite literally. His room in the beginning has the curtains drawn, and he appears at the end in the brightness of the garden. Anything else we need to know about? Yes. Nearly all novels explore universal concepts that everyone has experienced things like love, family, loneliness, friendship. These are called themes. The Secret Garden has a few themes that all centre on the idea of connections. The novel explores, for example, the way that health can determine and be determined by our outlook on life. As Colin's health improves, so too do his perceptions of his strength and possibility. The author also examines the link between our environment and our physical and emotional prosperity. The dark, cramped rooms of the manor house stifle the development of our protagonists. The garden and natural environments allow them to blossom, just as the flowers do. Finally, this book looks at connections between individuals. Namely, Mary and Colin. This necessity of human companionship is the novel's most significant theme, because none of their development as individuals would have occurred without their knowing each other. Well, that about sums it up, I think. That's a great help. Thanks. Yes, thanks very much. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by a software engineer to a group of IT students. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning, everyone. My name is John McNally, and as you know, I'm a software engineer. I work very close to Gatwick Airport in Britain, and at work we assemble flight simulators which are used to train aeroplane pilots. So, before any pilot is able to get in a real plane and fly it, they have to prove that they can operate all the controls in an aeroplane by flying in a computerised model. So, what does a flight simulator look like? Well, here's a picture of one. The simulator here is a model of a plane called an Airbus A320. As you can see, it's a large, almost round blob or box that moves on usually six legs to simulate the movement of an aircraft in the air. The legs tend to be driven by hydraulics, but there are some electric ones around. Either way, they operate to simulate the motion, the pitch and roll of the aircraft. 
The simulator can move up in the air or stretch, giving the trainee the feeling of flying upwards. At the very front, in the curved area here, is the mirror. And this is here so that images can be created that look exactly like an airport or landscape. Inside, the simulator tends to resemble an actual flight deck in an aircraft. And what happens is that generally the instructor stands or sits behind the trainee and positions the aircraft to any airport or any position on that airport using a touch screen. In this way, the instructor can train the pilot. And there are many tests that the instructor can put the trainee through. He can fail an engine in flight, for example, to test the trainee's ability to react to malfunctions. How does it do this? Well, the simulator contains many computers, most of which have to communicate with each other. That's my job. And I work with many other software experts on this. We work in teams which vary in size, and each team has a specialist area. But all the systems need to know what the other is doing. If the instructor wants to simulate a storm, for example, the flight experts need to know the strength of the winds and if there is any turbulence. At the same time, the navigation people need to know where the storm is, how far away, and place it on the pilot's navigation screen. And the engine experts need their information to ensure a safe passage. In fact, Landing an aircraft in rough weather is one of the most difficult things to do. And I've seen some very pale people step out of simulators in my time here. It can get very stormy in there. But trainees don't get into a simulator straight away. There are many different devices used in the training process. And this starts on a very simple level. One of the first things a trainee must know is how to input data into the flight management computer. The pilot on an aircraft enters information such as current airport, destination airport, as well as his route and other things such as the amount of fuel and aircraft weight. This procedure can be learned on a PC. Next, he may need to learn to manage the controls, for example, using the joystick to move up or down or left or right. He gets the feel of these controls and how they impact on the instruments. This can be learned on a fixed base simulator. Uh, that's one that doesn't move. Finally, he needs to take off, land and fly in the air during turbulence, etc. So for that, he needs a full flight simulator with motion. Trainee pilots vary in age and ability, and so the length of time it takes to train them also varies. Once a pilot has qualified on the simulator, they are entitled to fly an aircraft, but they are only called a first officer at this stage and must fly under an experienced captain, unless they are an experienced pilot who is simply retraining to fly a different aircraft type. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.